So welcome our panelists and uh, all participants. Um, the Global Media Campaign, everyone, welcome to this webinar. Um, today, uh, we are going to talk about how to amplify the voices of survivors of FGM. For a long time, uh, we have been talking about survivors and we never heard about their voices. And uh, it's time for us to listen to the horse's mouth. Let us get the facts from the horse's mouth. Uh, as they say, the wearer of the shoe knows where it pinches. So the survivors of FGM knows what we are talking about. Uh, let, let us give them a chance. Today we have a panelist. Uh, I start with uh, Zainab Ismail. Kindly introduce yourself. All right, thank you, sir. Dear, first of all, I must say that I'm quite delighted to be part of this conversation because it's a very important discussion and conversation that we continue to highlight in the media. So my name is Zainab Ismail. I am a journalist working with NTV, a media outlet here in Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, I have worked on, no, I wouldn't say widely, but uh, I have definitely covered issues of F GM through the different media stations I've worked in. And um, I think that what you've said in terms of having the survivors speak on, you know, the issues of FGM, not just in the country, but in Africa in general, is very important. Of course, I'm really looking forward to uh, participating today. MashaAllah, that's great. Uh, now I invite uh, Moni from Nigeria, kindly introduce yourself. Okay, so good to be here. Good afternoon from Nigeria. Moni Konlao is my name. Um, so we could stay with Moni so I don't get to confuse you as to how to pronounce my name. I'm a journalist here in Nigeria, Akure precisely, with Adaba FM in Akure here. And yes, I'm an FGM survivor. Wow, that's great. And uh, from my end, I'm Sadia Hussein once again, the founder and CEO of Brighter Society Initiative. And uh, I'm an FGM survivor. And uh, I'm glad that today I'm hosting Zainab. She hosted me at NTV once and uh, I spoke about FGM from a survivor's perspective. And uh, I am also a graduate of Global Media Campaign to end FGM. Um, today, we are also supported by a Global Media Campaign. On the background, Jeremiah Kipainoi and Alice will be supporting us from the background. I acknowledge your support. So going straight to the questions, I start with uh, Moni from Nigeria. Uh, Moni, kindly share with us. We don't want to hear FGM from the books or read from the scripts or from the TV and something like that. We want to hear female genital mutilation from the horse's mouth. According to you, what is female genital mutilation? And as a survivor, what do you say about FGM? Okay, so for me, I, I never heard about FGM until I attended the first workshop organized by Global Media Campaign to end FGM in Enugun. That was in 2017. And uh, we had an academy and it was quite revealing to know that there was a practice as such existing. And what was more painful was the fact that I discovered after I had to do I had to make my own inquiries about female genital mutilation after the academy because we had quite a huge session in Enugu then. And um, it was a whole lot because we had one-on-one -on -one with women there who, who had gone through a form of FGM. Okay, so listening to them, I wished that, you know, that had actually stopped and that it wasn't practiced anymore. But coming back after the academy, back to my house, I had to also make inquiries 
from my own parents to ask like, okay, so let's get this conversation straight. Was there any time that you had to mutilate any of your girl child? And they said, we don't call it mutilation. We call it circumcision, equating it with circumcision, which is of course wrong. And um, by the time I had that, that revelation, I felt that, well, this shouldn't have happened in the first place. This shouldn't, this is not a conversation that we're supposed to be having now because this is not something that is that has any kind of advantage coming from the academy, you know. So because I had the first hand information from the academy, and then so I tried to also look at how it's been with people around me. But personally, I feel that there's been a whole lot that is um a whole lot that we're not talking about. Take for instance, that same, I got, I got married in 2016. I attended the academy in 2017. And, you know, I had to, I had, yes, I had sexual problems at the beginning of my marriage. Why? Because for someone like me, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, at the, I couldn't accept a lot of things because I, I, I just couldn't come to terms with my sexual drive. Like, okay, so why is this wrong? But because I had knowledge from the last academy that here, it's, these are the, these are the um, downsides of this practice. I had to make inquiries and it was there I found out that I actually had gone through type one of the practice and Honestly, I, I couldn't <laughs> bring myself to understand why in the first place, because it was a disadvantage for me. But because I had knowledge as to why this was done, I had knowledge as to the fact that it was done to me. I didn't want to uh, amplify, I didn't want to amplify it based on that alone. I had to make a deliberate effort at, of course, yes, joining my voice to this because this is a case of a survival now. This is not just somebody who doesn't have an experience. So if you come to my tip, that was why I'm trying to put two things together. My experience from the academy now to my own real life experiences. Those women we met while we went to Enugu, many of them tried to open up. They make you understand that sexually they are doing well. They tried to, or they tried to help us understand that they didn't have any sexual problems that um, they didn't have to enjoy sex. Many of them even had to use words like, um, if they had to, if they had to have sex with their husbands, it's like a duty. It's not something that they have to, you know, there's no sexual pleasure, no nothing. They just had to do it, you know. I couldn't resonate with that because for me in the first place, that's not the essence of even having sex. So that's just like one aspect of this whole disadvantages we're talking about. I'm kind of amplifying it because people do not want to talk about this part. People believe or they think that sexual pleasure or yeah, they, whichever way you decide to describe it is probably not meant for the woman. That is according to the research that I had or that I've had even up to now. Um, even the two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, I wore one of the shirts inscribing in our local dialect that you and like that's on ending FGM. Okay, I wore the t-shirt and then a woman in my environment saw it and she had to accost me like, okay, so why is this? So I have to do a little bit of education. And when I mentioned the fact that practically, do you know that this has no advantage whatsoever? And she had to tell me like, okay, so how do I mean? I came down to a level to make a bit of understanding. But what, the moment I mentioned, um, I tried to ask her, does she enjoy sex? Was, I know she was circumcised because it's a pride for a lot of older women. It's a pride for them that they were circumcised. Was she circumcised? She said, yes, she was circumcised. Do you enjoy sex? She said they don't, she doesn't have to enjoy sex. I was like, wow, I don't get. Are you for real? Like, this is so much of ignorance plaguing on us. And we don't know, we like we don't care, you know. And I, I was really happy that I won her over at the end of the day. Why? Because uh, she has a younger daughter who, who was with her that day. 
And that one was, she was the one trying to help me explain in layman term that, okay, this is what she's saying exactly. And before she got what I was trying to say. So personally, I think that there are a lot of issues we are shying away from. We probably do not, we're, we're probably not ready for some conversation, especially uh, talking about our rights as women, freedom. Freedom to, freedom to enjoy sex for a woman is, is not something that people are around here. I'm, I'm talking from Nigeria, from this perspective, from my own point of view here. People around here, they don't want to talk about this. Probably they are shy to talk about many of these things. And before I, before I let this go, this is another practical, uh, something very practical that I experienced as well. Uh, one of the programs I had where I brought a lawyer, she's a friend. She's a practicing lawyer, and she she told me about another friend of hers who she had to settle a divorce case with her husband. And the reason basically was because the wife had zero sexual appetite, zero, like zero. When I say zero, zero, zero sexual appetite, and they, the man just has to look out. And because of that, they had to file for a divorce. And that was where I came in and had to help because I'm a survivor and I had enough reason as well to have zero appetite for sex, but I had to give the little help that I could give. And of course it was a success story for me because eventually they couldn't push through with the divorce. She got the little help that she could get. And I was really glad that she was open to wanting to be helped. And I'm glad she got the help, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, now I want to go to Zainab, uh, hearing from the horse's mouth and uh, listening to survivors' voices. So now how do we ensure that without further stigmatizing the survivors, we amplify their voices on the media? For instance, in Kenya alone, we are talking about over 4 million survivors with GM. In Africa, we are talking about 125 million survivors and globally we are talking over 200 million and now due to covid we are talking about 2 million another estimation of girls who are at risk of being cut how do we ensure that we amplify the voices of survivors on the media without further harming them or stigmatizing them zainab over to you all right, thanks, Sadia. So I've listened to Moni's story from Nigeria, and I must say it is quite incredible as a survivor what she had to endure, and quite astonishing as well with the fact that she came to actually understand and know about FGM after she's even married. So that's very interesting. So let me just give you a personal experience as well. Um, I come from a community. First of all, there's a misconception that uh, Muslim girls or the Muslim, you know, uh, community uh, encourage FGM, which is not true. However, I also come from a community called the Maasai community that uh, widely practices FGM, and that's something that's already open. Although there has been a sustained campaign in terms of trying to counter that as well. Um, my parents did not ascribe to that school of thought. Please forgive me if you hear any sound in my environment, I'm trying to figure out how to make that um, a bit silent. So anyway, um, it's very interesting to note, like I said, that uh, Moni's story has shown a different perspective into how people, uh, you know, understand matters of FGM. However, in the media, we have tried several, we've done a number of stories in terms of trying to counter FGM. And this is, you know, informational. We've talked to survivors of FGM. So there we've had you on our show as well. I think a couple of times you've tried to highlight the issues of FGM there. But I still feel there is so much to be done to help, you know, the communities, the affected communities understand more in terms of why there's a sustained campaign to end FGM in our country and in Africa as well, if we're not talking about globally. So I'll tell you an example of a journalist colleague who covered FGM a while back. Um, she did a story on, you know, a survivor of FGM. 
So this lady, um, you know, of course, I'm not mentioned names. So this lady did not go through FGM. She escaped and she was rescued. So she, when she, once she was rescued, she was taken to a home. However, the community did not accept her back because she did not go through FGM. So what happened was of her own volition and, inter, and, and, and ensuring that um, her community accepts her back and her family accepts her back, she had to go through FGM, unfortunately. So what happened was when my colleague did that story, it came out as though she, my colleague journalist, was stigmatizing the survivor. So it didn't look very good. And this was something she made a note of after the story was done. So as the media, I think we need training. And that I think is something that we're lacking. We need training in terms of bringing more information to survivors, the affected communities, as well as trying to bridge the gap between activists like yourself and the survivors, and especially the communities who really thrive in this, um, you know, this uh, FGM, for them to understand really why, you know, sometimes what we do is we, you know, we, they, because I've spoken to some of those communities and the guys who subscribe to that, uh, you know, that school of thought is that we do judge them. We judge them. We title them as the other, you know, the other community, those communities. So I believe once we sit down with these people, trying to understand why, you know, bring them closer to the con conversation, bring them in the conversation, and this is specifically, especially the men, you bring them in the conversation, then as activists and the community, we can be able to sort of create a platform where there's an open conversation such that even as we start changing the narrative, you already understand the reason behind why such and such community believe that FGM is important, yeah? So there's still a lot to be done, I believe. Like you said, the statistics are quite, you know, staggering. I mean, the statistics are incredible, they're big. And that is something that we need to look into. And as much as I, I know there's been a decline in uh, FGM cases in the country, but still the numbers are high and that is, something that we have to take note of. So as the media, it is certainly our responsibility to bring those issues to the fore as well. MashaAllah, Zainab, um, on that note, I wanted to ask you two questions kindly. Uh, All right. Number one, because of your name, people would start mm -hmm. uh, start asking me, Sabia, but uh, uh, she mentioned the Maasai community <laughs> and her name, you know, uh, kindly if you right. could clarify, number one. Then number two, with the media, uh, yes, it's the responsibility of the media to amplify the voices. And most of mm -hmm. the time, like now, right now, the media is really focusing on politics and not FGM. How do mm -hmm. we ensure that FGM stories from the survivors are also seen as a priority within the media, kindly. Right. So first of all, <laughs> like, yeah, so my name is Zainab Ismail, obviously. So you'd wonder, so the Maasai community is Thank widely, you, you know, um, Christian population, <laughs> let's say. I think there's a bit of an echo, there's an issue. Okay, it's fixed. So um, I'm a, both my parents uh, are Muslim. However, I was born and raised up in a Maasai community where there was an inter, interrelation between my parents and uh, you know, the community within which I was brought up in, which is in Kajiado County. But if I must say, Uko, you know, in the urban areas, sorry, in the rural areas, Uko Mashinani. So yeah, but uh, I did experience, uh, you know, growing up as a Maasai, 
in fact, I would say I'm a Maasai because my mother as well, um, part of her family is, you know, Maasai. So definitely I, you know, I subscribe to that. Anyway, uh, you talked about having a conversation on FGM throughout, but then again in the media, we realize that, you know, it's not a priority, like you say. First of all, there's an issue in terms of having this conversation, always seasonal. You will notice that issues of FGM always come up at a certain time of the year. And then we'll have a conversation and then it's going to be, it's going to be quite intense. We're going to have, you know, media briefings. We're going to have media interviews. And then at some point it dies down. Um, unfortunately, I might say, and this is from my own opinion, is the fact that our own audience, right? Our own audience, TV, newspaper, you know, mainstream media, social media as well. There is a high consumption of politics, especially in Kenya, a high consumption of politics. So our media stations will rely on having this, you know, these kind of stories as their top priority stories as compared to stories of, you know, for example, FGM. However, we do fight for having this, to have, to have these stories at the very top of the bulletin. And you will notice that if we do not have this kind of stories every single day, there are always long time features, you know, a feature that will probably, or a documentary that will cover about, uh, you know, 30 minutes or so, part one, part two, running through our media stations occasionally. Um, and then another thing is to get survivors to speak to the media at times is also quite a challenge, right? Some, and I would say some, or mostly, they shy away from having, you know, their voices hard and speaking on, you know, so-and-so issues. And I think it stems from feeling that they would be an outcast in, you know, in the communities or something. We've tried to really understand why some survivors would not wish to speak on the media and maybe even understand from uh, the survivors on this platform that we're speaking on right now, understand why, uh, you know, they, they don't like speaking to the media. So you can imagine it would take quite a long time to go to you know those and and you know you can you know appreciate the fact that this happens a lot in those parts of the country which you know not urban areas so in the rural parts of the country so it takes quite a lot of a long time to actually go there get the resources there sit down with these people uh, the communities you know uh, sit down with uh, the elders in that area sit down with. Uh, the local leaders as well, just, you know, to bring everyone together, all the stakeholders together, have the government's voice on this as well, because it is a policy issue. So have all these things together to bring a truly, you know, a factual, very, you know, uh, effective report to the media. So yeah, I think that's one of the issues. However, I also wanted to speak on what uh, Moni had talked about, and it revolves around what many FGM survivors have also spoken about on our platform, which is, you know, the TV as well as newspaper, is on a woman's sexual pleasure. And, you know, what we've come to understand is that there's a control issue here. So a woman is a woman's rights cannot be controlled by a group of individuals, right? As much as they're related in order to, you know, um, how, how do I put this? You cannot, this is certainly a form of controlling the woman. However, sexual pleasure is a very important aspect in a woman's, you know, relationship, whether she is married, you know, or in a relationship, long-term relationship, I believe. So it is very important to ensure that women do not go through this. Uh, it affects them emotionally. It affects them physically. It affects them psychologically. And so I think what we can also look into is in terms of the mental health that FGM, uh, you know, uh, impacts on a woman as well, Sadia. Wow, that was quite uh, elaborative. Thank you so much, Zainab. Now, um, 
back to Moni. Moni from Nigeria kindly. Uh, Zainab uh, highlighted that it's quite challenging to get the survivors to share their stories on the screen. How do we ensure that we build the capacity or the confidence of the survivors so that they'd be able to speak freely? Um, in regards to also what you said, that there was a lady that, that was almost divorced because of going through FGM. How do we ensure that those kind of survivors can actually gather confidence and be able to share their stories so that we save these girls who are at risk of falling into the trap of female genital mutilation? Kindly, Moni. Okay, so thank you, Sadia. Um... I'll pick it up from where Zainab stopped about uh, speaking up. It's for, for us here, it's not in the first instance, you can't shame anybody who uh, is a victim or a survivor, let me put it that way, I'm sorry. You can't shame anybody who is a survivor of female genital mutilation. People here believe that it's a thing of pride that you, you shouldn't feel any different as a woman you shouldn't feel different from who you used to be okay so i know that for a lot of people around here in nigeria speaking up is not the issue however it is identifying and being able to know that your voice is going to help someone else take for instance if i hadn't spoken up the lady who had divorce issues wouldn't know that i went through that and, and now I'm, I'm lending or I'm giving help. Okay, so I think that it's important that we have this conversation. And the best way to have this conversation is on the radio. Okay, so if, if for instance, you don't want your face to be seen, we, you just want your voice to be heard. I think it's important. If you don't want your face to be seen, probably because uh, you feel that um, this is not something that you want people to attach a face to, you could put your voice on the radio. The radio, for me, I, I prefer the radio for any kind of conversation because people tend to listen more through the radio. People are not distracted by what they are seeing if they're looking at you through the TV. So you could decide to do this on the radio and a lot of people, this is this is more access, accessible for a lot of people. In, in, amplifying, in, in amplifying this, I think it's important to, do you know the amazing thing? Many of these women, I've heard this news. The, the woman I, I was mentioning earlier about uh, in my neighborhood who saw the description of my clothes, she mentioned it specifically to me that they have heard over the radio that female genital mutilation has to stop and that they should stop it. But because I had a one-on-one -on -one with her, I was able to win her over because there was a conversation on the radio earlier and she just needed somebody to affirm that by talking to her. So I think it's, it's important to not let this conversation stop. The moment it stops, the moment it stops, there's going to be, I feel there's going to be a bridge. We have to continue to amplify it. We can, there's no other way to say it. We have to continue talking about it because everybody has to, every hand has to be on deck for this to really uh, come to fall. This is not a, a case of abuse or shame or being, um, you, you don't probably, you don't want your face to be seen or something. No, FGM is not a thing of shame. For a lot of us who have gone through it, we, sur we survived it and we are doing very well. So I think if we let people also see this part, probably we'll be able to have more voices come and share their own experiences and encourage other people as well that we can, we can actually go past this. Yeah. Okay, Moni, thank you so much. Uh, my question is like, uh, for instance, all these survivors we are talking about do not have that confidence that you have today. You say that the conversation should not stop. But my question is, if we have gone through this FGM, why are we again doing it to our daughters? Some of the men, uh, I think Zainab mentioned that we should also engage the men. But yes. again, the same men will ask you, uh, the people who have been affected by the FGM are not even speaking. They are not even saying that, what happened to them is wrong. So where is the problem, uh, Moni? Why do you think all these survivors, millions of survivors are just silent and they continue inflicting the same pain on their daughters, kindly? 
Okay, so um, I'm a Nigerian, so I probably would be speaking from the Nigerian point of view. <laughs> we have a silent culture around here, which is actually one of our ignorances, and it's actually a bad side for us. A sil the, the culture of silence here is on the high side. So this is not just about FGM. This is not about FGM alone. In everything, I was on the radio this morning and we were talking about why we have so much of road crashes. And this is also hinged on the fact that people would be in a moving bus and because the driver is probably not driving well and they will keep quiet. So this is not about FGM, basically. This is about a Nigerian factor for me around here, people don't know how to speak up. However, I, like I said, for the few of us who have a voice, if we keep talking about this, this is it's just like when you are doing something really good, okay? Uh, uh, let me try to look for a, a, an example that we can relate with is maybe uh, people feel that wearing a black shirt is bad because it's attributed to mourning or uh, something really terrible, like something terrible has happened to you. But if you see me wear a black shirt in a very good design, like wear a black shirt and there's a way I carry myself and another person wears it like that, maybe just two of us, if you have a black shirt at home, you would also want to wear it and join us. So I think this is this also depends on the people sharing the story. We, we don't have to necessarily come out from the aspects that could make people go into their shell. We could actually come, that was why I mentioned my own perspective. I didn't keep quiet when I had the opportunity. I had to say it as well. Okay, so this is my story. And this is where I am today. This is what I have gone through because I needed that voice to help someone. So I'm saying, Sadia, that we could come to a point where we share this story, not just because we want to convince people a little, but because it's actually the truth. And we encourage more people to want to share their own, listen to my story and be inspired to share your own story as well so that we can drop these knives or the blades as the case may be. These are not very interesting times. People are not, people are not interested in you just coming to say one thing without you giving them practical examples as to why they should stop doing something. The women we met in Google feel that we just came to, you know, while away time, they wouldn't give us the attention they did. That's why also community engagement one-on-one -on -one with many of these women and even men is important. And I, I said it earlier as well that we can't afford to stop or bridge this conversation in any way at any point. Sadi, I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, sure. So now, um, thank you so much, Moni. Now we have some, uh, some questions. Great work from, this is from Mildrain Sub. Sabuami, he says, uh, great work. Do the panelists think that by the year 2022, we shall end FGM globally? So I think that one, uh, it's something that you should answer, all of you, both Zainab and Moni. Uh, especially in interior areas, FGM is still a major problem in Kenya. Uh, then someone says, uh, there is need to build the capacity to win this war, yes. Um, okay, so we need to find other ways of ending FGM. I mean, change how we handle this monster called FGM. I think that's an area you should also think about. Someone else says, um, how do we make or encourage? This is from Yusuf Dauda. He says, how do we make or encourage FGM survivors to speak up is more people will tend to believe them more than other campaigners, which is true because, you know, listening from the horse's mouth, the way he told you, Moni, so how do we ensure that? Then uh, we have so many questions. So can it be possible to come up with a community protection strategy that will encourage victims to speak up? That's another good question. Uh, Someone else is said um, the seminar uh, training capacity building is not enough. I think FGM should be a whole topic in our schools. Wow, that's true. The, the media plays a very great role in influencing the masses. When we see Zainab Ismail coming, 
uh, out strongly on ending FGM. She's a role model. Wow, that's great from Eric. Um, so people are are really asking those questions. Can we have like uh, we come back for the other questions? I think we have two questions here. Are we really optimistic that we are saying we we will be able to end FGM? And uh, then the other question was, how can we ensure that uh, the survivors of FGM or even the victims of FGM can speak up? And I think this is one area that everyone uh, have been singing and saying, okay, we are all saying we should end FGM now, we should end FGM now. Where are the victims? Where are the survivors? And I think I will start with the Zainab. Kindly uh, tell us how do we ensure that um, ending FGM is also a priority in the media? What are the takeaway points that we can actually build on when we are trying to look for a space or an airtime in the TV? Uh, what are the most convincing messages that the editors can actually pick so that our stories can be heard on the media? Zainab. Um, hmm. Zainab, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. So can you hear me? Yes, yes, all yes. Right. right. So as I was saying, um, first of all, this is a sustained campaign that has gone on for many years, I believe, you know, decades and so. And we've seen um, improvement. We've seen us moving forward in terms of eliminating this cultural vice. However, there is still so much to be done. We cannot give it perhaps a timeline at this point and say by, by next year, we are completely finished with FGM and everyone is safe. It is always going to be a sustained effort, not just by the media, but by the government as well and the activists. It is a multi, um, it, it has to be approached by you know, a multi-team and, and all the stakeholders have to work together in terms of trying to achieve an, a free FGM society, if I may put it that way. Like you said, in terms of having the media step up its game, in terms of having the survivors speak on this issue and having their voices heard, like I've said, it's true that uh, we might not have given 100%, and this is from my own opinion, However, the media stations, like the one that I work for, is always open and always looking at writing and at broadcasting and airing and trying to cover as much as we can in terms of social issues. FGM is at the very top of that list. So there are a number of issues that we need to fix fast. As journalists, I want to say, I'm not sure if, I'm, I'm sure there's one journalist from West Court who said uh, uh, she's listening and it's so good to have that. So first of all, I think we need more journalists from those interior areas. We need those journalists to also just make sure that they also cover the people from those areas and give us those stories so that while we are seated here, in Nairobi, we also understand what is happening in those areas, like we say, Mashinani. Um, another important issue, and I think Moni would probably agree with me, is the fact that as journalists, we really, and I've said this before, training is really important. We need to educate ourselves. We need to uh, get the skills in terms of uh, helping people uh, air out their views on FGM. There is a number of ways within which we can go wrong in terms of um, covering FGM issues. First of all, it could be judgmental language, which can cause harm, you know, uh, at some point. But I think this has phased out right now, um, you know, the, the use of the term like a victim. So we, we've already phased out that and we, we know we don't call survivors victims anymore. Hopefully, uh, you know, 
maybe even survivors can have a different name. Perhaps I was reading somewhere um, an online platform that said, or was it an organization, I believe, that said they would wish to, you know, have people who've gone through FGM not termed as survivors, uh, maybe termed as, you know, affected communities. I don't know, this is just something that I'm thinking. However, as a media, we need to always keep ourselves updated in terms of, you know, judgmental language. Maybe that is why some people don't want to speak to us, you know, and, and, and air their voices on the same. Another issue is making this agenda issue and not, and, and maybe anyone can correct me on this, agenda issue and not a cultural one. You know, sometimes we, we might have, stigmatizing news coverage, maybe portraying FGM as a cultural, you know, and maybe this is what we do all the time, you know, a, a cultural issue stemming from, you know, the traditions, you know, you know, insinuating about such communities being, you know, not well educated, perhaps, and that is why they, 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 they subscribe to, you know, FGM. However, we always have to make sure that it's a gender issue because it affects women and, and young girls and girls. So this is certainly a gender issue as much as it's also a cultural issue, but that should be a secondary to the fact that it is actually a gender issue. And what else? I think uh, we have a lot to do in terms of the media. I want to say that. And I think it takes, you know, you guys, activists and, you know, the other partners that you work with to probably come up with a way like you've, what you've done today, which is quite incredible, but you could come up with a way within which you can bring in the media to the table and have and set an agenda on how we can be able to also cover issues of FGM in a sustained way in, you know, it shouldn't be seasonal, you know, it should be on a way that we can be able to do these stories occasionally you know within a year we probably could cover a number of stories even you know five ten stories and this is, would be across all the media platforms across all the media stations that we have in the country so yeah bring us on board i believe we're very open and my editors and you know the other media partners as well will be very open to having a conversation and ensuring that the issues of fgm are widely covered because without you people as well we cannot be able to, you know, reach the people that you've reached, you know, reach the survivors that you've reached. You have more contacts, you have more information, you have more statistics than we do. So even as we do our research, you're very important in terms of helping us reach the survivors and having these issues on the table and these issues covered widely as well. Sadia. Thank you so much, Zainab. Um, that was uh, quite elaborate. Someone is asking, Joseph Amuke is asking, how can we commit the local politicians at the grassroots level to condemn FGM without losing votes in the next general elections in Kenya? <laughs> That's a valid question. We need to push for legal framework on FGM at national level. What's your take? That's from Wuri. Um, Legal framework. Okay, so um, someone is saying uh, the media should work with the grassroots civil societies. Um, someone else is saying some of the media persons here in Nigeria believe FGM is a necessity for females and it makes it hard for awareness on that to be taken serious. Really? Maybe. Oh, that's. Okay, um, then uh, Wuri again is saying, is this FGM media campaign has to do with Kenya only? Okay, um, I think Moni, kindly, uh, Moni from Nigeria, uh, we have some questions that, uh, that are touching and uh, a lot of people are asking. I, th I think you can also ask these, um, answer these as well. Uh, perhaps you can give some highlights um, someone saying that uh, media persons in Nigeria believe that FGM is a necessity. Maybe you can shed some lights on that. And again, uh, on the survivors' perspective, from the survivors' perspective, 
kindly tell us now that you heard what the media feels and all that the ball is on our side how do we ensure that we have more survivors in our campaign to end fgm money thank you sadia can you hear me yes i can hear you okay so um First of all, let me take this question on, um, I think it's a question on uh, media persons here in Nigeria, believing that FGM is a necessity for females. Okay, so I don't know where this person is calling from or sending the message from, but I believe strongly that uh, presently where I am, people cannot say that they are not aware of that FGM is no longer acceptable many people around here already know that FGM is it's presently in Nigeria, it's a criminal offense. And uh, for some states that have passed the VAP law, um, I accept that people do not just want to comply. I do not believe that people boldly, as a matter of fact, during the last um, campaign we had, on ending FGM, medicalization of FGM. The health personnel made us understand that people don't openly practice female genital mutilation again. The people who do it have to secretly do it because they don't want to be caught. So yes, we have passed that era of people saying they do not know. People know, but still go ahead to do this for reasons best known to them. So saying that uh, some media persons still believe, media persons cannot still believe because the message is passed through the media in the first place. So if a media person is still saying that FGM is a necessity for females, then that person's um, media personality should be questioned in the first place. However, moving on, I think that this conversation needs to be amplified. So I've said this before, and I think I need to say it again. We cannot keep quiet and expect other people to join us in this campaign. It's not possible. There are stories of people, let's take for instance, rape is one example. There are people who come out to talk about uh, being a product of rape and how they have been able to overcome the challenges, the stigma and all of that. Why? Because they are, they are survivors. That was why Zainab mentioned it earlier. This is not a case of being a victim. When you say somebody is a victim of something, there's a way it helps the person to withdraw into ease to a shell because being a victim of something is quite, the, the, it sounds on the negative side, use of the right word. Okay, so, and I think she mentioned also that we're probably going to also look for another word instead of saying survival as well. So I think it's in the way we carry the message. The message has to be said rightly. And in, 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 in capping that, I think it's important to bring more people by telling our own story. And uh, honestly, it's, it's not easy to go outside when the people even inside are not talking about this. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course, I can hear you. Okay, okay. So, so for me, I think that we have to, we, we, I'm talking about activists and campaigners, um, journalists who are survivors need to talk about this on a daily basis. Even in talking, not like your, this is not even when you are asked to talk about your own experience. You could say it while you're talking so that, the person, you, you never can tell another person's story. The person knows that you're talking about it and it's not a big deal or it's not supposed to be a big deal and you're not letting it be an issue. So I think that basically it's important that we, we, we don't bring out, we don't make this sound like a big deal at the moment. I don't think it should be a big deal. The moment you sound like it's a big deal, then people want to withdraw into their shell. Can we make this part of our campaigns? When you're talking to people, can you let them understand? It doesn't even have to be your own personal story. Do you know stories of people around you, your, your sister, your auntie that was stuck?
concise, how she how she was able to come out of a story and all of that. We could use many of these stories to inspire people to come out and also join their voices to ending female genital mutilation. It's a conversation that we have to have over and over and over and over again. And I think if we, that's why I said that we can't afford to have a bridge. We have to continue talking about it. And the more we talk about it, the more people will come on board. Okay, so now, uh, thank you so much, Monique, for that insight. Uh, now uh, we'll give uh, time to our participants to also say something, uh, be it questions, maybe over to you, Jeremy. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Sadia. I think this has, this has really been an important session. Um, I will just open it really to um, everyone, and I'm just going to allow you to speak. Uh, don't be worried because you will soon um, get the notification that you are allowed to talk. Um, don't feel pressured if you're not ready to, but I know uh, there are some people who already have their hands up. So I I'll just have it back to Sadia as we already have two people whose hands are up, uh, Isandegua and Wurie, and uh, we could just pick it up. I would just encourage everyone, uh, let's be very brief during the session so that as many people as possible can ask questions. And finally, let's focus on having media, uh, having campaigners on the media, basically, sorry, uh, how do we have uh, more stories of survivors on the media? That's the topic for today. We all have other sessions coming up. So let's try focus on survivors on the media today and be as brief as possible. Over to you, Sadia. Thank you so much, Jeremy. So now, uh, Isan Degwa, kindly, um, how do we ensure that we have more survivors on the media? And uh, that's our topic today, so kindly. Isa? Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go on. Yes. OK, I'm happy and uh, to be actually on this platform. Zena Bismail, I'm happy to see you again. We worked together <laughs> some time back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, and I'm um, also glad to see that uh, you're one of the people who are engaging in this uh, very important conversation. Anyway, right. mine was, uh, as I had typed in the chat, uh, I was talking about the risk of amplifying the voices of survivors. First is uh, to understand uh, that uh, uh, difference between victims and survivors. Because in most cases, I've seen some media reports when uh, highlighting voices of survivors, they tend to picture them in that victim view, or which it goes contrary to what a survivor is supposed to, you know, appear as. A survivor is supposed to appear as, you know, um, a person who has prospered, a person who has empowered, is a store of success, so that they can uh, uh, be like role models to other survivors to also feel like, they can come out and talk about their issues from a positive perspective rather mm -hmm. than from a, a perspective of pity. And I think that's a critical issue that we need to think about. Also, uh, it's very important to create a safe space for survivors where they feel um, they are free to share their stories uh, without fear of being uh, uh, judged or Hard. Um, there are some times uh, people feel like uh, when they give their stories as survivors, they can be misconstrued and uh, um, projected in a manner that is, you know, giving the FGM perpetrators as the victors here. So uh, my view is how do we then use the voices of survivors to portray them as the victorious here, give them that power, rather than use the stories to show the perpetrators of FGM as the ones who are victors in this case. And this is something that has also been happening, for instance, in, in, in cases of uh, um, terrorist attacks. We've often had people saying that more light is given to perpetrators rather than the survivors of such attacks. And it ends up giving the perpetrators actually more limelight than the survivors themselves. 
So in my opinion, I think that's the view that you have to take or the approach you have to take that is more survivor centered rather than the, you know, the act itself, the FGM. Thank Those you so much. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Isa. Um, I saw another hand up. Charity. Uh, hi, Sadia. Hi. Uh, my name is Charity Wangoi. Um, from, I work with Grits Kenya. Thank you for this session, and it's good that the initiative has come from the media. I don't know if you can hear me clearly. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I I don't know. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but um, I feel like um, it is a good initiative that the media is, is also looking at um, documenting some of these things as a tool of social change. But I think after documenting, we should also have follow-up uh, action plans. Because what happens is you get that there's a very good strategy. Somebody has been vulnerable and has allowed you to be in their space because talking about some of these things is, is like relieving uh, some of the things that have happened to you. So what is the, uh, so we have documented the story and then, you know, because a lot of times we hear the stories on, on media and all these things and the way uh, journalists from NTV were saying that uh, it's, it's like seasonal. Uh, during the international day of uh, anti-FGM in February, we have a lot of stories surrounding this particular topic of discussion. So I don't know um, what idea you'd, you'd have to say about the, the after the story, then what? Uh, and especially for the survivors who uh, will see the comments, uh, will we'll watch the documentary, do they have a voice uh, before the documentary is aired? Are they called to go and preview to say that uh, I think that until this point, maybe I don't want this to air, um, or they, they just find themselves on TV and also have to deal with the, with the aftermath of some of these stories once they are, they are disseminated to the public. Yeah, but that is a great initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charity. I think that one will be answered by Zainab later. So now I, I, I can see Maggie Oken, the CEO of Global Media Campus. Maggie? Uh, good, good afternoon, Sadia. Thank you very much. Really very interesting discussion and we're all learning so much every time. So I just wanted to say two things to address uh, the points that were raised about the seasonal nature of the coverage. And I just wanted to remind anyone that, that that's interested that the global media campaign tries to ensure that we support activists who campaign on the media much more regularly than that. Every eight to 10 weeks, we work with direct action media grants to try and encourage, or not, not encourage, support activists who want to highlight um, issues around FGM on the media and who are working with survivors who have chosen to speak out on the media. So we, we think it's very important to try and keep this constant flow of information about the medical effects of FGM, about the fact it's not a religious requirement, about the fact that survivors want to speak out. So if you are interested in taking part in, in, in with these direct action grants, you can join your local group. There's a group in every country, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Mali, um, where you will get support from other activists and you will find out how to actually apply for these direct action media grants, which are open to people who are interested in using the media, who are passionate about ending FGM and are part of this community of activists who are doing it. So that way we keep the, 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 the news flowing. And the second thing on survivors, I'm a former journalist. I used to work with the Guardian newspaper and uh, I spent a lot of time as a war correspondent in Bosnia and various wars. And I think the important thing is that, that often survivors want to talk, uh, but I think you have to, as responsibility, explain, you know, this will be public. There may be a backlash uh, and do your best to be upfront about what the risks are. Uh, I think that's all we can do, but we should do that very carefully. Thank you. Thank you so much, 
Maggie, I think uh, for those who are not speaking kindly, mute, mute yourselves. Uh, now I give to Mamadu. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, of course, I'm Uri Mamadu Tambabari. Um, are you hearing me in the first place? Yes, yes, yes. go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, um, as I said, I'm Uri Mamadu Tambabari. Um, the Chief Country Coordinator for Network Aid. Um, basically, we, we're based in Sierra Leone and uh, we do have our branches um, in other parts of um, Africa, but normally we are here in, in Sierra Leone um, seeking for the welfare and well being of um, illiterate women and girls and um, persons with disability as well. Um, of course, um, FGM is, is very central and um, uh, it has a whole lot of um, twists and and tone in terms of um, understanding and and um, discussions. Um, for for Sierra Leone, of course, the 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 work has been long going and is still ongoing, and um, there are different um, aspects to it with regards to um, political issues and um, also have economical issues and, and and all the rest of it. Um, as of current, there is there, there, there is a conversation um, in terms of trying very hard to see how it could be um, maybe put together a legal framework, and you know, for the country to 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 discuss or the lawmakers to discuss around it. But um, despite all of that, there is there is, there is a huge media 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 challenge media gap um, uh, in Sierra Leone. So in, in terms in terms of in, in terms of in terms of survivors, you know, um, actually speaking up, and more or less, it's it's more about activists maybe engaging um, people who are uh, maybe perpetrating it, maybe like the sowies here. They call it the sowies. Those who involve in in, in in the actual cutting, who involve in the actual cutting. So. Um, one of the things I want to draw, one of the things I want to draw, of course, FGM is, is different by country to country, um, the way they look at it and the approaches, um, the approaches used. Um, here in, here in, in Sierra Leone first, it, it, it's highly political. FGM is highly, highly sensitive and very political. And um, not all politicians would definitely come out to voice it. And, and the stigma and the stigma associated with um, FGM is, is very high. So, so, so to have survivors, you know, uh, maybe gathering the stories in terms of, in terms of um, um, their, their, their face, you know, um, maybe putting up um, in, in media. For Sierra Leone, there is no, um, there is no survival stories maybe play in any of the TVs, in, the, in any of the radio or TVs to say, well, I am, Miss, I am Miss A, B, C, and D. I have gone through this thing and this is my take and I want others to emulate short. Um, there was, there was, there was uh, um, an interview done with, with um, uh, a senior um, person of this country who, who happens to be a female and and um, she was asked about um, her position with regards to FGM. And one of the things that she says that, I mean, she cannot talk about things that she's part of, you know, which, which, which should have been a very big um, influencer, you know, to this process. That um, she, I mean, she's seen nothing bad with it. Um, she has delivered, she has given birth. There's no complications, there's nothing. So why? Did she, I mean, come to talk about things of that nature? You, you can see the challenge, you know. So um, when Maggie um, actually talked about um, maybe this kind of um, support, you know, maybe it's also good to to maybe to understand country by country nature and and maybe able to support in terms of first trying to educate um, the the illiterates because as as an organization dealing with illiterate women. And most of the people engage in as a survivor or whatever, or maybe as a victim, mostly are illiterate people. 
who are unable to read and write, not by their making, but maybe by cultural setting and all of and, and all of it. And those who might want to come up as, 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 as a survivor are those who are educated, you know, maybe in the big towns. So we need to understand this kind of dynamics. And the bulk of the people who are survivors who are yet to speak out about the ills, about those things are in the villages and they are not the one who can read and write English or maybe French, read and write French or whatever language it is. So um, I, I want to submit here that, I mean, even though we need the voices, we also need to look at what the perpetrators is. Some of these things are a livelihood, a livelihood for the perpetrators and they see it as a form of income you know, so asking them to, to, you know, persuading them or maybe engaging them to see reasons to, to let go. I mean, there must be an alternatives, you know, not long-term alternative. It can be skills. It can be skills and other things for them. But um, I mean, let's keep the conversation going. And one of the things I want to submit here also in terms of think is in terms of engagement. I mean, we are now deeply in the social world. In, in, in the digital world. Um, using animations, you know, um, we need to take the, the, the campaign beyond radio. Not all, not all communities, even in Kenya, not, not, uh, not all communities maybe have access Thank to you. radio Thank signal. So but, some of this, yeah, but some of this, maybe lastly, please, lastly, please, please. Okay. Uh, I'm Thank very, very sorry. Uh, I mean, this is my question. Okay, because um, of time and we have so okay. many hands up, kindly, if you have any okay. other additions, you can just type in the chat box and Jeremy uh, from the okay. group media campaign will take it up kindly uh, so that we give oh, other people okay. also. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure, thank, sure. Thank sure. you so much. Thank you. So now, uh, Joseph Amuke is asking, can the gender officers and the stakeholders at the grassroots levels be trained on how they can capture short videos and clips of FGM survivors they work with every day. I think um, with this note, yes, it's possible. And the global media CEO has already said that they, they can support anyone who wants to join the campaign. Then with that, you can actually try and uh, capture as many survivor voices as possible without further stigmatizing them. and kindly seek their consent first. And uh, let me give Dr. Chris, Dr. Chris. Maggie, your hand is still up. Dr. Chris, can you hear me? Okay, we give Helen. I can hear you. Okay, go ahead. All right. I, I want to congratulate Weber Media Campaign for organizing this, and then you are, you are doing a very fantastic facilitation work. I just want to talk in respect of giving the, giving the survivors a central place. They must take ownership of this process. And this when they are properly capacitated to be able to air their views in the media that we can say we have succeeded. Unless and until that happens, we will just be very tangential to the whole issue. Having said that, Nigeria will be having their election in 2020, 2023, less than two years from now. And one of the things we, the main engaged Nigerian network, is working on is also to make the issue of female genital mutilation, a campaign issue. And the people who are going to drive it will be people who are survivors. I mean, to make more impact when they are part of the campaign. And so I just want to give kudos to the effort being made currently. But at least I was very, very wonderfully and pleasantly pleased to see one from Nigeria, Nina doing a marvelous work. I felt so proud and I can always raise my shoulders. I will have people and a journalist by training who can always be a very strong advocate. I would like to take her contact because we need to have some this kind of synergy uh, here, back here in Nigeria to be able to move our own process forward. Thank you very much, 
Maggie, thank you very much, Sadia, and for the great work you're doing. Thank you, thank you. Now we have Helen. Helen. Yeah, hello. Hi, how are you? I hope everybody is hearing me. Yes. Yeah, Helen Gadogo from Laikipia. Uh, thank you so much, Global Media Campaign. I always uh, like, uh, always following you and being part of it. Now, I've had uh, the theme and as a person who is uh, having a safe house where we have these survivors, there's always uh, something that ha has always uh, bothered me. I know somebody has already said that uh, mostly that uh, uh, survivors appear like they are people who are looking for sympathy. Then what I would say is, and request the global media campaign, is it possible because when the, there's one problem, media house uh, or media whatever uh, raises issues about uh, a certain girl, a certain case, and that is it. And uh, there's no following follow up and uh, the survivor feel like I did the wrong thing. Is, it, is, it, uh, is there a way that a global media campaign read by this lady in uh, NTV, because I know she's very passionate and follow Is there a way that you can start a fad where that uh, if, if a case is raised, you are able to follow it up. And if it is getting back to school, the, the girl gets that scholarship. The other thing is alongside with that, that we come up with a, a way that we are able to follow up these cases. So that like uh, you have the numbers to do with, uh, with the primary to secondary uh, school, that we can tag along these uh, survivors so that we are able to even follow them and they can come back as mentors in the community. And finally, uh, one other thing that they, we feel is that we give a lot of time to the, to the organizations or civil society organization or activists uh, more than the, 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 the survivors themselves. Is there a way that when there is a meeting outside this country, that these survivors can also be considered also to attend? Instead of having uh, civil society uh, leaders going and uh, being the voice of that, is there a way that uh, the, uh, the, there is a FAD that can also see them also attend to be able also to, to mix with others from other uh, countries and they're able also to learn from them and come back as a real strong champion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. I think that's the purpose of this masterclass. How do we ensure that we have more survivors on board? Because for a long time, it seems that we are speaking on their behalf every time. How can we have and ensure that we have more survivors on the media? So now we have Chuku. I think Chuku Dire, then we have someone else, only one, one more person. Uh, Chuku, kindly go on. Chuku, Chuku, Dire, something, yes. Oh, okay. So now, uh, because of time, I give. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry, I was, I didn't unmute. Okay, okay so, um, uh, thank you, uh, Sadia and Global Media Campaign. You know, I, my name is Peace and I'm calling from Nigeria. I log, I logged in from Nigeria and there is something, I was one that posted something on the media, you know, seeing it as some of the person, seeing it as a necessity, you know, to circumcise girls because at some point when I got into in um, creating awareness for this FGM. I started moving around. I, I started wondering actually, why is it not always on the media from this part of my, you know, from this part of the world, Nigeria to precise. So I started going into the media houses, some of them, and unbelievably for me, I saw that most of them I get to talk to, or I, I got to, you know, speak to concerning this will end up entering into some kind of a debate on this should be done, 
that this is done in my state is a normal thing. I should, this is not a news. Like I'm just, um, um, I'm saying something that is uh, people normally is something that they even celebrate in some of their con in some of their states in Nigeria. So they say it as something that is normal. I you know when some people like that see things like this as normal, how are they going to even take it up as something to go and talk about? You know, in their news, uh, cast, in their casting stations. So well, that was one of the challenges I met. And another one is that sometimes for the survivors to, to come out and speak, I think there is something about them having some, for them to be able to come out as, and speak, I noticed that there has to be some moral support they must have seen either from the person speaking or from the person that is creating the awareness. If there is no concrete support they are hearing from the person speaking, maybe, okay, this is this. If you need any assistance in social, social things in your community, or maybe your peer group is trying to pressure you to do this, and there is nobody to run to, to speak to them, or maybe if they have that kind of challenge and they don't get to know, or you don't get to feed them about things that they can do to help them stand that kind of pressure, you'll see that it's very hard for them to come out and speak. In, during my choice, because what I did was, I had to even go to my state government, I stay in Lagos. I went to my state government. And funny enough, I got to some point where they started asking me in some of these ministries of college ministries of health or ministries of youth and development and women. Some of them will come and center you and be asking you, like I've had like two cases or so in different offices, ah! being surprised at who, okay, I'm not circumcised, I get it. But then they were surprised at how am I even surviving? as somebody that is not circumcised. So they see some people that are even not circumcised as like, are you serious? You can actually survive without being uncircumcised. And these people are the people you're supposed to pass some letters through to talk to some of the heads of the, of the ministries. You know, when they say this kind of thing, you come in and pass it to them. They will just see your letter and be like, hmm, that is thing, there is nothing, why are you even stressing? They will not, they will not even attend to your letter not talk of taking it to where you're supposed to get to. So they, they argue it within themselves. They look at your letter, they read it through because for you to be able to meet anybody in any of the state government house here, you need to pass a letter to some of their family secretary to get to some of their, you know, the letters just pass from one table to another. And all those people you're passing letters to, they will want to know what is inside the letter. And now you, you, if you meet some of them and they get to see some of these letters and see that you're talking about FG and they'll be like, hmm, Especially the ones that are very that are that are carrying the thing on their head, they will want to make sure that you don't that this letter don't even move anywhere. That so them that are that are when I say anchoring it in their village, they don't know what they are doing. So you want to be the one that will come and start, you know, bringing out some of these things out like that. It's not even necessary. That they, they, don't, they thought it's something that is more that is very important. So sometimes they don't attend to the letter. You need to be there or be visiting them almost all the time for them to carry that letter out of one table to another on a normal. Yes. So that is another challenge to get these things down to maybe government that might even help to assist in pushing some of these things, you know, across the states. Then I saw that it was a difficult thing to move around to get to some of them, um, to get to some. Please, can you hear me kindly? Because of time, let me cut this short. Uh, now that you have seen the challenge, how can we ensure that we get those survivors on radio and on the TV? That's why uh, kindly you, you can that's why I said I think I've said that already the first time that if there yeah. could be some kind of moral support they get from whoever that is creating that awareness, whether it's on the media or whether it's from any piece of place, anywhere the first the, 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 this um campaign is being spoken to or spoken from. Let there be some support line, help some people they can actually call to. And then if, sorry. Thank you, please, because of time yeah. now, I'll give, uh, we have only five minutes now, I'll give someone else to say something. If you All have right, some pending uh, additions that you would like to also make, you can kindly 
put on the chat box so that uh, Jeremy can pick it up from there kindly. Okay. Uh, Thank you very I much. Can see Pacific. Welcome. Pacifica on Yes. That is yes. Question. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Pacifica. Be brief. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Pacifica. The TV and radio. Okay. My name is Pacifica Ongecha, a grassroots woman from uh, Groots, Kenya, and uh, indeed a GBV responder. So my concern is that, uh, okay, we are saying that um, we would want the FGM uh, survivors, the victims, as we are calling them, uh, to come up and uh, speak out on media. But my worry is, like now in our country, Kenya, and in part of the region where I stay at, at, at the moment, uh, FGM has turned to be something that is now being done in a sect a group of people who have organized themselves and they, they pretend to be religious. Of course, I would call it a religious sect. Um, then uh, they are practicing this um, in, uh, in that format of uh, a sect. So what, what this means, it, it, they're, they're, these are big numbers. So the FGM survivors, after undergoing this cut, it will become very tricky for them to come up because these sects are, are taking, these things are happening and the sects are known even by government but nothing much is being done. So the, the, the survivors, the, the FGM survivors would be quite, it would be quite a challenge for them to come up because they are, they'll be the target. And then now there'll be a target to a bigger number. And like in the past or in some other regions where yeah, FGM is taking place, but it's being done at the family level. But this is being done as a sect. So when it turns out to be a sect, you're talking of a bigger number and a bigger risk for the FGM survivors so we really need to be working out we really need to be talking about how are we working out how are we talking to government to stop this uh, to come up and curb these uh, sets that are coming up in big numbers in our regions thank you so much thank you now uh, i think we are coming close to our session now i'll give zainab and moni uh five five uh, uh five minutes each to respond to some of the questions. I hope you have been noting them down. And uh, kindly, I start with Moni. Moni, uh, if you can hear me, uh, everyone has spoken about the challenges survivors have and how can we ensure that we have as many survivors as possible on the radio and also on the TV without um, for them regretting by speaking let them speak with the confidence and how do we ensure that what are your five takeaway points that will ensure that we have many survivors on the tv and the radio moni thank you sadia so um it's been such an engaging session thank you for this opportunity once again so many questions so many realistic questions have been asked and um i would like to start from the Peace, I think it was Peace and Pacifica that spoke last. Honestly, we cannot do this campaign successfully without the government, without having the backup of the government. And I think it's important that we talk about it. If we want to get on the radio, for instance, if we have, if we put out, um, if we put out adverts on the radio or campaigns on the radio to say that FGM has to stop. It, it's not me going on the radio to just say that. There has to be a stamp by the government. Take for instance, if I have to go on radio now that this message is brought to you by the global media campaign. And I say in collaboration with my state governments, Ondo state gov in collaboration with Ondo state governments, there is nothing that would make somebody go ahead and say openly and say that female genital mutilation has to continue. So in, in in bringing this all to a close, I think one of the first things that we must do while we wrap up this session is that we must endeavor to bring on the government in our different locations. Peace, I know you, I, I understand your worry as I listen to you. I think one of the things you need to do is to work with people at, at the top to get your campaign or to get it out. You can't do this on your all by yourself, especially when you have a lot of people around you who are not on the same page with you you need to strive it's a lot of striving you have to do it you need to strive to get people at the top to uh, be on this with you so that you can get your voice heard as well and in this you should ask this question has you need to ask this question 
And there's a way you go about it. That's why I said earlier as well that we need to share our story. We need to not make it look like it's a big deal. Share your story from time to time. If you have the opportunity, if you're funding, if you're if you're if you're at the if you're on the radio or on the TV, whichever platform you have as a media campaigner, you have that opportunity to share your story. It will inspire another person to share his or her own story as well. There is no stigmatization whatsoever with FGM survivors. It's a it's it's not something that we have to be shy about to talk about. We need to come out and talk about it. There is no other way to bring this this uh, to leave this in the board than to talk about it. That's why I said around here in Nigeria, the culture of silence is, is it's on the high side and there's no there's no remedy to it than breaking that culture. We have to break it. We have to come to terms with the fact that FGM is was an issue, is no longer an issue. The issue with FGM is practicing it. If the practice continues, then it is an issue for us. If the practice doesn't stop, then it is an issue. So all hands must be on deck and we must ensure that we amplify our voices in whatever area, even if you are the only person that is in your environment that uh, talks about this, please do not keep quiet. Continue to talk and encourage other people to speak up as well. Thank you so much, Moni. Uh, now, before I give it to Zainab, I can see uh, Lisa, Lisa Kamara, kindly. Hi, um, hello Sadia, hello everybody. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Hi. I know that um, you're about to close very interesting discussions, but as takeaway, I just want to um, give this one advice to activists um, talking on the media. Um, as we deliver our message, we should deliver our message with respect in order to be able to convince our people. And sometimes if you come from a region or a country that associates FGM highly to, um, to, to, to religion or Islam, um, it will be, it's really important for you to know how you deliver your information and also know how to respond to those counter attacks on the, on, on the radio, on the TV. One little mistake can jeopardize your whole campaign um, in the region or in the community where you are at. Let's deliver a message with respect in order to be able to get the impact we need. Because if not, we will get resistance from our leaders, religious leaders, and that will cause a lot of problems for us. And for activists as well, please, um, let us always consider giving ourselves self, you know, self care. Let's consider consider our own mental health. Sometimes we're out in the field, uh, field or talking on the radio, and the response is not very good. We're attacked. If we need to take some time for ourselves, let us take some time for ourselves and take care of our own mental well being. It is important. This job is not easy, and talking to people to try to to convince or change perceptions is not an easy task. People have been doing it for decades. Um, so let us take care of ourselves and then also deliver our message with respect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. I can see someone says sometimes survivors are either too embarrassed or ashamed to come out because of in the stereotype associated with patriarchal societal tensions on women. And this uh, gives me the right to ask you the question of uh, Sometimes most of the survivors feel again uh, that they will be further stigmatized if they go on the screen. What are the five away uh, takeaway tips that you will give us so that survive? We have more survivor stories on the TVs and on the radio. As a journalist, what angle should we base our survivor stories on so that they are also given priority as other? Uh, stories that are being highlighted or even given headlines on the TVs and radio. All right. Give us All right. two points that we should focus on as activists and also mm. as campaigners and as survivors as well. All right. Thank you, Sadia. Well, I'm trying to, I'm going to try and count to five. <laughs> Hopefully, it will make to five. However, what I know, one of the most important things we can do as the media. Can you hear me? Kindly turn your camera on. Oh, mashallah. It's actually on. Can you see me? Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. Yes. So as I was saying, I think one of the most important things we can do as journalists at this point is because we have highlighted, uh, you know, issues of FGM uh, regularly, and I would say occasionally in our media stations, is probably trying to even positive stories out of it. For example, 
uh, by positive, what I mean is there are a number of people who would have been subjected to FGM, but we've seen young girls rescued. We've seen young girls probably run away from, you know, homes to go and get even a better future ahead. So this is maybe some of the issues that we can also highlight to show that, by the way, there is a way, there's an alternative way to life other than actually enduring FGM and it being the only way of life, right? So giving out that information to, you know, young girls to also know, because they are usually the most affected, to also know that there is a way out for them, you know, and activists working together with us and giving them, you know, um, an idea on how they can be able to escape. Sadia? Yes. Yes, again, you are off again. The, your video is off again. The camera. Oh. Okay. I, I don't know what the issue is. Uh, let me try and see. Now, okay. now I can see you. And, and what about now? Oh, you have put it off again. Oh, boy. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. You are turning off or... Know. Just, um, okay. Wait. Sorry, can I just, uh, let me just, just give me a minute. Just uh, put on your camera. Yes, it is on, I think. Can I just continue as I try to yeah, yeah. fix that? Okay. Right? Okay. As I was saying, I hope you can hear my voice clearly though. Uh, yeah, yeah, very clear. Oh, all right, sawa, sawa. So one of the other issues I think that is quite important to note is uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, by the way, pledged to end FGM by 2022. So it was an issue that was raised earlier on. It is a very noble initiative, but is it realistic? I am not so sure. Maybe you guys as activists can also tell us about it and how us as the media can be able to come in and at least achieve to a certain extent, that initiative, that ambition by the president, because this is, you know, that is something that uh, has been lauded by different stakeholders on the same. However, one of the other issue I think that is quite important to note as well in terms of addressing this issue is the issue of the criminal justice system. So we understand that, you know, in terms of prosecution, of the people who perpetrate FGM, it is very hard to come up with evidence because we've seen, you know, a change in tactics by the perpetrators. And I think activists should also be aware of this. There's a fact that, you know, and, and, and this was on the news just recently with the director of public prosecution saying, you know, the new tactics that, you know, perpetrators are employing is quite difficult to, to, to capture. For example, there's that cross-border issue as well, where young girls are taken from Kenya, probably taken to, you know, the neighboring uh, countries for FGM, for example, Tanzania. So I think that's also one of the issues that is coming up quite, you know, um, highlighted in this matter. And then another issue is FGM, uh, the perpetrators are cutting girls right after birth. So, so this is also another issue that I think uh, we can also try and give coverage on in terms of having, you know, the affected people speak on these issues. We talk about stigmatization and why some people feel like they would not be able to speak to the media. Like I said, I think we also need to have skills. We also need to have journalists educated and uh, journalists given the training, proper training in terms of how to handle and write stories. Um, pictures matter a lot. I work for TV, so pictures matter a lot. At this point, we stopped uh, airing pictures of like what we used to many years ago, you know, pictures of razor blades and blood. So that was very traumatizing, especially for those who had already gone through FGM. So creating a group of journalists that understand how to treat and how to speak to survivors and how to you know, use the right terms and titles and give the, a story, you know, the meaning that it needs and the effectiveness that it needs to actually even hold the policymakers to account, you know? And another issue that we also spoke on was 
I think that was also highlighted is the issue of um, politicians being part of the conversation. I think it's not just in Sierra Leone or in Nigeria that we have that issue. We also have an issue here in Kenya where, you know, certain politicians who come from certain areas would feel like if I do not, if I speak on these issues or against issues of FGM, I would not be able to get votes. So where do we draw the line? Where do we, you know, uh, where do we where do we bridge this gap in terms of holding politicians to account? Because at the end of it all, it is the same people who represent the affected communities, and it is the same people who create policies. For example, in Kenya, we already have you know an act that pro prohibits FGM. So then again, how do we push for that forward? Right. So I think at the very least, or what we can do as stakeholders in this fight is Sadia as an activist, talk to us as the media. We are here to bridge that gap. We are here to create a connection between, you know, the policymakers, like I say, the state, the government, so, and the activists and the communities, the survivors and, highlight the issues and create a platform where there is an open communication on the same, right? So us, we are not just a conveyor belt of information. We are certainly a platform that can, you know, educate and inform people and give people, you know, a platform to speak on. But I think the most important thing, like I said, is having a group of trained journalists that will be able to give, you know, survivors an idea that you know being on the media is something that can help them like for example what we do is cover faces like for example even in other issues like um you know um defilement cases for example of children what we do is completely cover the survivors faces we cover their you know we disguise their voices so even in this case of FGM, those who've gone through it, especially the young people, what we do is give them a platform by, by ensuring that they would remain anonymous if they want to. However, if having a voice, you know, like you said there, you've spoken very widely on it, you've spoken very openly on it, you've spoken about what you went through and why this happened, how this impacted you, and you're out there, but not many women would actually be willing to do that but we are willing to open the platform. And it's always been there. I guess the information has just not reached, you know, the people that it needs to reach in terms of ensuring that their identity is completely protected when it comes to airing, you know, their stories, because their stories are the ones that actually matter the most. Like Moni's story, who would have known, you know, as a journalist, she has gone through this. And it's, it's so empowering to hear her story and it would help another young girl from Nigeria listening to, to Moni speak on this issue. So yeah, so the, unless there's something else I might have forgotten, I uh, would just like to thank the Global Media Campaign for this. It's a great opportunity. And I believe it's just the beginning of a conversation that we need to have regularly and more and more of it, and just ensuring that, you know, like you said, this is an action class, a media, an, a media action class. It's not just a webinar. So what we can do is even after this, come up with an agenda and an idea on how we can be able to push forward, you know, the coming together of all the stakeholders and pushing forward on how the media can be able to yeah. cover and air this um, issue of FGM. Beautiful. That was wonderful. Amazing. Uh, Zainab, thank you so much. Um, yes, indeed, media is very, very powerful. And that's why we really want to have as many survivors as possible on the radio and the TV. Because you can, you can understand that um, when we are talking about FGM, it needs a holistic approach towards ending it. And uh, media is a very powerful tool that we can all use uh, to be able to eradicate FGM in totality. And that's why today we are saying, where are the 200 million survivors? Can we have them on the TV? What are the issues that can actually help us ensure that we have 
as many survivors as possible on the TV because you can imagine one TV talk show can reach millions of people at a go compared to during this COVID having an outreach where you can reach only a maximum of maybe 30 people, something like that. So thank you so much, Dana. If you want to say something, I'll give you, I can see your hands is raised. Yes, yeah, sorry. So there's something also very important that I forgot to mention is not just the use of mainstream media. We can be able to make use of social media. And I think someone also mentioned that at some point, this new digital and social media is highly effective in terms of information dis dissemination. I, I would not have met Sadia if it was not for social media because she's very active on Twitter. Um, and we meet a lot of people, especially those who campaign against FGM on their social media platforms airing you know, their views there. So mainstream media can only, and at this point you can only imagine that we reach a, only a certain targeted audience. So from this, we, we can take away from this and of course of course it still reaches a huge a huge number of the population but social media is also very important because it reaches a huge demographic as well uh, and you know it can cut across you know religion cut across class cut across you know race and it can it, it can the information that we use on social media, would be highly effective because it, uh, you know, like I said, it reaches a lot of people, Sadia. So I think we can also look into that and how we can be able to uh, push for that as well. Mashallah, thank you so much. Zainab, as you said, yes, we couldn't have met if it wasn't for Twitter. And yes, indeed, I wouldn't be on Twitter if it wasn't for global media campaign because they are the ones who trained me on how to use both social media and the mainstream media on to amplify our campaign and uh, today i i am a proud graduate of the global media campaign thank you so much our panelists zainab and uh, moni uh, thank you so much to the global media campaign uh, my colleagues jeremy and alice for the background support and also the entire global media team for this campaign and also to their supporters and donors of the global media campaign that's the UNFPA for ensuring that these master classes go on and on I think this is not the end as Zainab said it's just the beginning thank you so much to all our participants and to the survivors who got the courage gathered the courage and confidence to be able to share their personal stories on the screen I think this campaign will go on and on from my end I am Sadia Hussein, your host today, and uh, the CEO of Brighter Society Initiative. I am an FGM survivor. And to give you one inspiring thing about me, uh, I have three daughters. My first born is 13 years old. The second born is 10 years old. And the third is seven years old. That's my last born, actually. They're all daughters. And Alhamdulillah, they have been created perfect by God. They have not gone through FGM. That was my personal commitment. I've saved several girls, hundreds of girls from FGM. And I have four FGM free villages. And global media campaign have been there to support me, taking the religious leaders to speak, and also trying to use both social media and the mainstream media to amplify the voices of survivors and also the religious scholars. That's why I ran the, the campaign FGM, my, not my religion. We, can, we also have a hashtag survivors to end FGM or survivors end FGM. You can still vote, I think. Back to you, Jeremy. And uh, Maggie Oken, thank you so much because of the, uh, what do we call the Kapenguria training, Media Academy. I was able to be transformed. And I wish the the, the media academy can again uh, be done so that we can have more of Saadia, hundreds of Saadia who can be who can use the media to amplify the voices of survivors as well as the campaigners. Thank you so much.